Yeah, so hi everyone and uh, welcome to our interviewing series where we interview uh, computer science faculty, primarily new uh, computer science faculty about their job search and interviewing experience. And today we are here with uh, Tei Chang, who primarily works on human-centric uh, software engineering and who will join uh, Purdue University as an assistant professor in fall uh, 21. So Tei, congratulations for obtaining an assistant professor uh, position and uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you, Emmanuel. It's uh, great to be invited and uh, talk here. Yeah, so um, when exactly will you start? Uh, I will start in August the 16th this uh, summer. And uh, when will you move there? I will move there probably in early August. What have your preparations uh, been so far? Did you, for example, already prepare any materials for teaching classes or also? Right, uh, so um, the department wanted me to teach a class in the fall, so I don't, Unlike many other uh, new faculty who often get a kind of like a gap year or teaching release, I don't have a teaching release. Um, it's but it's a seminar class, so it's going to be easy. But the department needs some materials like the syllabus to be sent out to the students, so students can take a look and decide um, whether they want to enroll or not. Right. So they reach out to me. I think a couple of weeks ago and asked me to prepare this kind of like decide on the class title um, and also the syllabus, a rough draft, draft of the syllabus so they can send out to the students. So I that's something I have done now. I have uh, prepared the teaching syllabus. It's a graduate, graduate seminar class. So it's a lot of paper reading. I picked all the papers, decided all the paper title, you know, the, the structure of the class. And uh, yeah, that's, that's something I have prepared. Other than that, uh, because you know my postdoc just uh, ended, so I was spending a lot of time uh, finishing up, uh, wrapping up projects in the, during the postdoc. So I haven't really got the chance to start, you know, reaching out to, to faculty members at the Purdue, talking about uh, grant proposal writing or you know like collaboration. I haven't really done that yet, but I'm planning to do that uh, since now I'm. <laughs> Uh, kind of like I'm employed, um, uh, so I I now have more time to to um, to work on that during this month and also next month. Hopefully, we'll also have some time off in between. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. Before uh, continuing, um, could you explain what you did um, before the hiring season? Like you already mentioned, you did a postdoc, and um, also before that. Yeah, I did my PhD at. Uh, in computer science at UCLA. And my PhD is mostly about, uh, I have a lot of software engineering background, um, but kind of like in the middle, uh, I think during my third year, I realized that only, you know, software engineering has a lot of focus on developing automated approaches, right? And, you know, in my third year, I realized that automation may not quite be efficient or sufficient uh, for solving some real world challenging problems and we need to get a human in the loop. So I started working more on humans, um, uh, HCI, human computer interaction, collaborating with HCI folks. And then, um, then I actually did a postdoc at Harvard with uh, HCI professor, uh, which I find really helpful. It just brings a completely new angle to, um, to, to a problem solving um, solving some challenging software engineering and PL problems. And also kind of like, uh, also I also kind of like enriched my skill sets, you know, uh, learning how to build interfaces, interaction design, and how to do user study and many other HCI components and research methods. So that's, that's kind of like how I prepare for, or it's, it's more, it's not, it's not how I prepare, um, uh, exactly how I prepare for the job search, but I, I kind of like my career path um, and the, the career path that lead me to the point where I decide to uh, apply for a job, uh, academic job. Okay. And I also noticed that you have collaborated with uh, psychiatrists before, right? So it seems you're doing quite some um, interdisciplinary research. How did this influence um, the job process? Did it influence it in any kind of ways? Yeah, it's it's a it's a great question. I, I'm glad you noticed that. Um, so this collaboration with a uh, psychiatrist and the Harvard Medical School Mass General Hospital started after I started my um, my postdoc at Harvard. 
And, you know, I, the first week I was there and then the professor, there's a professor, machine learning professor, Finale Doshi release, reach out to me and my postdoc supervisor. And the, she, I built some visualization for, uh, for code purpose, you know, visualizing hundreds of code examples. And she feel very excited about this uh, program because she got a lot of health records. She and her psychiatrist collaborator have a lot of uh, electronic health records and they want we to build a similar realization on top of that, um, on top of the electronic health records. So I started working with her um, and started this project. But you know, it's, uh, it's off of the topic. It's it's a uh, it's a uh, takes a while because there is a lot of restrictions about who can access the data. It's highly confidential, so I have to go through a lot of screening and apply. It takes like half a year to actually get access to the real data. Mm -hmm. that I can, I can build visualization on. And then, you know, it takes a while uh, to me, for me, because I haven't really worked on this medical domain yet. So it takes me a while to really get started. Um, and also I was on the job market, I have other projects going on. So this project kind of like, it's growing very slowly. So when I, uh, when I started my job application, like a half a year later, I started this project. It's it's not quite there yet. Like we do not have, I do not have any publication. I have a two prototype ready, and I have um, yeah, I have done some uh, formative study with those doctors in Mass General, Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, that's all I have at that point. So. If you're asking like whether it has an influence, yes, it does. Uh, because I indeed talk about uh, about this uh, work in my future work um, slides during the job talk. And when I talk to other folks who are interested in healthcare, I have this uh, background knowledge and experience that can help me talk about that. And also, this is something very exciting. You know, like uh, it's it's significantly broadened my. Um, my view and uh, makes me realize that even though we are doing computer science, we can actually um, like work on something societal or like uh, in other domains, not just in computer science. So it just brings me a lot of opportunities, a very different view to look at computer science. So I think that's the influence, not in the job search level, but actually in my research, like the uh, vision and the research taste level. So I think, uh, if you are asking, like, does this, this experience bring me any, you know, uh, new opportunity in terms of job search? Like uh, some uh, universities are looking for interdisciplinary, people who work on this interdisciplinary research. I think the answer is no, uh, because I, as I said, I do not have any publication at that point about this project. And uh, I was not known as uh, a person who works extensively uh, between healthcare and uh, and a software engineer or HCF, so I think in that perspective, no. Um, but uh, it does bring some uh, something that I can I can talk about during my job talk and talk about during my one on one interview with other faculty with similar interests. Yeah, that sounds very exciting and uh, like a enriching experience. And um, like a bit more general questions. So, like, what do you think um, the role of a postdoc in general can be to help um, during the the job search? Also, yeah, that's a great question. So, I think um, I think the job search, uh, the postdoc. I I first. Well, I shouldn't uh, give a strong opinion on this because uh, different people may have a different views about postdoc. Uh, just this is just my personal view on postdoc, my own postdoc experience. I think it's uh, quite helpful for me. You know, when I graduate, uh, when I finish my PhD at UCLA, uh, a lot of people said, "Okay, Tianyi, you are ready. You can you can go on the job market." Because I at that point I have a couple of publications in terms of publication record. I think I'm doing fine, but Deep in my heart, I know that I'm not ready yet. I haven't, I'm not, I was not mature enough at that point or like mentally prepared enough at the point to take this big role of, you know, advising students, uh, writing grants, teaching and all this, you know, like I wasn't ready yet. I, deep in my heart, people may keep call me this kind of like imposter syndrome, but I can tell for sure that no, it's not. It's not an imposter syndrome because I know at this point, I know that when I, 
I know the feeling that deep in my heart, I'm ready. Like when I fin finish my, in the second year of my postdoc, I feel this eager of going on the drug market. I feel I'm mentally prepared. And I can tell the difference. It's not an imposter syndrome. And I, I think people should stop calling it imposter syndrome uh, because this is real. Like uh, sometimes people, people are not mentally ready uh, and they should not be rushed into the mm -hmm. drug market. You know, it's kind of like you cannot throw a kid to a basketball court and playing basketball with a lot of adults, right? It's not like, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's uh, super analogous to that. Um, and I think, and you cannot, and people should not expect the kid to grow up immediately, you know? Uh, so I think I, I, I think this is a two year postdoc, um, actually one year because second year is mostly just the job search. This one year postdoc is, uh, it's helped me a lot to give me a kind of like a um, buffer to actually think more deeply about uh, my future career paths um, and also um, how to give me a time to prepare for that, both uh, mentally and also like in terms of the skill set. Uh, I think that it helps me quite a bit. Makes sense. So I would say let's um, continue chatting a bit about the preparation phase. And the first question there is, um, at what point did you decide to apply for academic positions and how did you proceed after that? Um, I, I will answer your second question first. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think I got super interested in the um, academic jobs. Um, in my, I think in my third year, my um, uh, PhD, um, I, it takes a while for me to be, to uh, really think about that as an option, because uh, you know when I started my PhD, I was not sure that I can be uh, really successful in terms of uh, research, um, and also I did, and then I did an internship at, in the industry, and I, then I did an internship at Microsoft Research to just kind of like get experience of different kind of jobs, and then. Um, during, also during this process, after three years of research, I realized I really like doing research. The freedom of working on some topic you find interesting, not taking orders from your boss, you know. Um, and also I kind of enjoy this experience of collaborating with people and advising uh, some undergrads and master students. So at the point I think I got super interested, but I, have, I wasn't sure yet, like I'm a good fit. Right. Um, definitely faculty job requires a lot of uh, uh, skills, experiences, and the personality, certain kind of personality to su survive. Right. So I wasn't sure. So I give it another three years. You know, during my, uh, the last three years of my PhD, I was kind of like preparing for that. Um, but mostly, you know, in terms of research, you know, make sure that I have worked on exciting research and make sure I'm doing well in the publication, etc. cetera. Um, but then, as I just answered in the previous question, I realized that it's not just, you know, doing great research is not sufficient to be effective, right? And that you have to have this skill to talk to different people um, and this, uh, like all the soft skills, you know, uh, building a vision about the future, um, et cetera. And that takes me like uh, another two years to prepare. And in terms of uh, uh, preparing for apply, um, I think I started preparing in October. Yeah, I think I started applying in October. Um, this is probably very different from other candidates because first I have done my, uh, have finished my PhD. I wrote my dissertation um, and I uh, have this postdoc experience. So a lot of times people start, I think, I, I think for the new graduate students, you know, who haven't finished their dissertation yet, they should start much, way much earlier than me uh, because um, I already put a lot of thinking about my research, you know, just trying to and build a vision, you know, during my, when I write my uh, PhD dissertation. And that takes me a lot of time, a couple of months to just thinking about the, how to write the introduction and the, how to write the, um, um, how to write the future work, you know? Um, and I, so basically I, I already put a lot of thought there. And when I do my um, 
job when I started writing my job application material, like the research statement, teaching statement, it's mostly kind of like just borrowing a lot of thoughts from that stage when I graduate together with some new thoughts um, during my um, during my postdoc. Because I indeed started a new line of research during my postdoc. Mm -hmm. And that takes about, I will see, uh, it takes about three months. I'll put it three months there because uh, I wrote the draft, you know, um, sometime before the deadline from August to December uh, 20s, like two and a half months um, to, you know, put together a story. But then I also spend a lot of time after that to revise my material during the process. Um, I mean, it's it's uh, it's not like it's not like uh, I'm I'm not able to update it because once I submit it and the people start looking at it, I cannot update it. Uh, but I can actually use that to change to to revise my job talk. You know, like the story I want to share with people in the job talk. So it's. In terms of preparing all the teaching statement, uh, uh, research statement, and the diversity statement, it takes about two and a half months. Um, and then I takes it takes me like two months to to write the to put together my first job talk slides. Um, and I have been revising my job talk slides during the past. Like my last interview is in April, early April. So during from February to April, I'm still, you know, constantly updating my slides. I have like 14 different versions, like major versions uh, of uh, jobs talk slides. So mm -hmm. I did, I indeed put a lot of thoughts and spent a lot of time revising my job talk slides. And it's, it's a continuous process. Again, not everyone has to do this um, because I feel like I, um, yeah, I was, I was just uh, deciding. I, it takes, I have a hard time to decide what I want to talk. Um, one reason is that I have worked on many different topics and I, it takes me hard. Every work of mine, I find them very interesting, but not other folks, of course. Uh, so it's kind of like, for me, it's hard. I have a, uh, it takes me a while to decide which work I want to talk about and which work I want to focus on and which angle I, I should tell my story. So. Okay. Um, yeah, earlier you mentioned that you did um, internships, for example, at Microsoft Research and so on. Um, did you ever also consider applying for industry positions? Yeah, Microsoft Research is the only industry um, industrial lab I have applied. I didn't consider other places uh, because as I mentioned, the, one of the reasons I want to um, be stay in academia is this uh, flexibility of working on different topics, right? I have a uh, very good experience um, working with folks at Microsoft Research, um, and I like the, the vibe there, you know, um, the style, research style there. Um, and also um, Microsoft Research right now, they are doing a lot of interesting stuff together with, the, with their, their developer team, like uh, Visual Studio, and um, um, the program census team, um, you know. So I think that's that's a great place um, that uh, I will be super excited if I work there. So that's um, that's the only industry uh, position I have applied. Mm -hmm. And also to expand on what you said earlier about selecting what to present as future work, do you believe that there's some kind of balance between doing something that you're uh, comfortable to talk about and that you can defend well, for example, because you very well know the related work. And then also something that um, is not a direct continuation of what you did before. Yeah, so I got, actually, that's a great question. I, I got this advice when I prepare my job talk slides, um, especially the future work that people suggest me to uh, prepare three slides, talk about three future directions. Two of them must be something that I have, uh, uh, that the audience can easily see the connection with my current work. Um, and the third one can be something like very bold and uh, not quite relevant to my, um, to my current position, um, my current research, but it's super, I personally super excited. So that's the wise I got. Um, 
Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think we have to, in terms, if we want to, if the a candidate want to be strategic, uh, which is also the right thing to do, um, they can actually, this is a good advice to follow, you know, uh, because if we think from the other perspective, from the search committee's perspective or from the department perspective, they want to hire somebody that they know will be successful, will can successfully get tenure in five years. Otherwise, why did they throw this uh, big amount of startup funding on this uh, guy who, if they are not sure that uh, he or she is going to be successful, right, after five years. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, um, that's why I feel like you indeed, high level principle is you need to, if you want to successfully land a job, right? You need to convince your audience that your future work is exciting enough for them um, and they see a lot of potential in it and they have confidence that you are the person um, and you can actually successfully uh, carry out those uh, future research ideas. You know, that's the something that um, I think that's the high level principle. But on the other side, I think um, sometimes people can be very conservative after hearing this otherwise that, okay, talking about some uh, incremental step next to their last project or something like that. And that's, I think that's not a good move uh, because it's gonna be too incremental, not so exciting. Um, and the, sometimes it could be very niche, right? Um, so it's, it's really have to uh, find a good balance um, between like something that is achievable and something that is uh, big and impactful enough, right? And the one thing on top of all this, my suggestion is to actually pick a direction that you actually feel excited about. Because people can easily tell if, if this is an interesting direction, but you are not excited about it. People can feel that when you are talking to them or when they see you deliver a, a future um, direction. So when I prepare my future direction slides uh, or future work slides, the first thing I make sure is, okay, I need to find a bunch of future directions I actually feel super excited about. I'm willing to talk to people. I'm eager to talk to people about this during my job interview. And of course, that means if you are super excited about it, of course, you're going to read papers about it, right? Of course, you're going to spend a lot of time prepared for it. So I am not very concerned that people will, I'm not worried about people challenging me. Um, uh, because I've already like started reading um, some uh, related work. Even though I don't know some, I, um, it's very likely that they may point me to something that I don't know. I think that's fine. But you have to show that your excitement, the confidence, and the knowledge about something. It cannot be something that you know very little about, right? Um, so that's, uh, uh, and then after I gather together this bunch of uh, future directions, I pick the ones that I feel like I, and rank them and then pick the ones that I feel like, okay, um, apply the strategy I just mentioned, which one is uh, something that I can achieve within the next one or two years, uh, which is the one that is a little bit far away from my current research um, and it require me to probably work on for three or four years to, to, to uh, finish that project. And uh, yeah, something like that. Makes sense. We already talked a bit about uh, preparing the application package. And um, one uh, question that is perhaps a bit superficial, but uh, I'll ask it nevertheless. So what kind of length would you suggest for the individual statements? Oh, yeah. I think for the research statement, I recommend first, there is no, I think most schools do not have a length requirement. But you have to consider that you do not want to write a very long like a thesis about your research uh, uh, because people the your in, uh, the employers you know the search committee need to take time to look at it if it's too long they will not you may take they may not even finish reading it right um so my i think the the number i follow is five pages for including references so basically four pages plus reference for a research statement and uh, two or three pages for teaching statement and one or two pages for diversity statement. And at least the one institution I applied for 
they had a strict uh, um, page limitation, uh, what would you have done in this kind of cases? Would you have like shortened your, uh, for example, research statement or kept the original length? Did, it, did this actually happen to you? It, it didn't happen to me because most of the schools said that the, uh, you need to keep your research statement within five pages, right? Um, I don't refer. Um, let me double check how many pages I have on my research statement. Oh, actually I have three pages, three pages plus references. So I have four, four pages for the research statement. So it never occurred to me. Um, I, I know I saw that there are some schools have a page limit, um, but then it's often within four pages or five pages. So I don't really have a problem with that. But if it happens to me, I will probably not going to cut. I mean, four pages is still short. It's mm -hmm. also short. I like, I, I don't know. It will take me a lot of effort to, to reduce the lim page limit to like three pages, including references or even two pages. And I think it's just not worthwhile. Um, I see. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you just checked your statements and you actually have your a research teaching and diversity statement on your website. Yes, so, um, I still keep them there because I think other people may want to look, uh, right. like future candidates may want to take a look. So I, I will post it there. And was this also helpful to list them on the website during um, the interviewing season? Did, for example, do you know whether any of the professors, for example, um, check them uh, beforehand? No, I don't know. Uh, but I think I suspect that people will take a look. Uh, sometimes when they see your name, they may not want to bother to actually log into their faculty search system. You know, every school have this system, right? Uh, it will, like you have to log into it, dig into the, um, the file and then find the person's research statement and the teaching statement, right? And the, it's, but it's much easier if we just search my name um, on the Google search, find my web page, and then look at my documents if they are there, right? So I think it's just saves a lot of effort for the faculty who are interested in, in my profile um, in that sense. It's, it's, um, and also other folks who are, um, who may be interested in collaborating, right? Um, research statement is a very good um, uh, synopsis about your research in the past five or 80 years. People are busy and they probably will not spend the quality time to writing down this. Uh, they probably do it every couple of years when they are ready for promotion or like recruiting students to be updated. But actually right. this is the opportunity to, uh, to get everything together, you know, um, and of course they like it, have it online so other uh, future candidate students, um, PhD candidates, um, and uh, people who are interested in applying your position for your uh, PhD position will take a look. Can you comment um, what, like how useful it is in general to have an up-to-date uh, website that actually also lists, for example, most of your accomplishments and so on? I think it's, uh, it's uh, quite important, especially for junior faculty, because junior faculty are often actively looking for PhD students and the master's students to work with, right? And it's, it's, um, it's gonna be very helpful um, to, for those students, uh, prospective students to look at your website and figure out what you are up to, right? Uh, what makes you excited about. Definitely, I think it's, uh, it's not it would be very ideal that if, for example, I have a page that has not updated for three years and all the projects listed there, are kind of like um, three years old that I'm actually, me or my students are not working on. But I think about the future student, prospective students spending like a couple of days to actually read through all these projects and decide whether they want to apply or not, right? It's, it's just like for the, for the prospective students, it's a waste of time. And for the, for, for the faculty, it's, they may just miss some students, like uh, talented students who just happen to realize they are not interested in the old projects um, the faculty has been working on, it's, but is not actively working on. So I think, um, and sometimes people will say, you know, just look at my Google Scholar, look at my DBLP uh, page to read my recent publications, but I think it's hard, you know, People collaborate. Uh, sometimes people publish with other folks on topics they are not excited about. 
So it's hard for the prospective students to tell like what is really um, the faculty excited about, what is uh, their own projects, right? Um, and uh, I think just having a short summary about the projects um, they are working on, uh, their recent students um, and all that stuff uh, have an updated website will be super helpful in that perspective. Yeah, and uh, perhaps as a last question about the preparation process, mm -hmm. um, letter writers, so how did you um, find your letter writers? How did you basically approach them? And then how also did you ensure that they would uh, submit their uh, letters uh, in time? Yeah, I don't actually spend a lot of time finding letter writers. I mean, I have a PhD thesis committee um, and I, both people, most of my letter writers are from my PhD thesis committee. And I have uh, collaborated with other folk, folks like Dean Hardman is a professor I have collaborated uh, before. Um, and I'm still collaborating with him. So I, it doesn't take me much effort to actually reach out to him and say, hey, Bjorn, do you want to write me a letter, right? Um, and also all the folks on my, I have five letter writers, all of them are either on my PhD thesis committee or it's my collaborator or my mentor and Microsoft Research. So I pick those folks that who know my work um, and also know me as a person, right? Uh, I, I, I remember I got some advice very early on, you know, before I started my postdoc that I, I need to make friends with some big names, you know, and uh, get their letter. I think um, People may want to do that, but I personally didn't do that uh, because I feel like I already have a good uh, list of uh, letter writers. I'm already collaborating with uh, people that I trust and uh, I, I have uh, look up to. Um, so I feel, yeah, in that perspective, I didn't actually think much about how to select a letter from letter writers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, it's also, Perhaps a good advice, even if you uh, don't, um, let's say, collaborate a lot. Uh, like you said, if you have a uh, thesis uh, committee that judges your work and you can, for example, sometimes it's possible to select an external um, examiner. At least this was the case for my defense. Mm -hmm. And actually also then ask this person later on to uh, be my letter writer. So that yeah. might also be useful for PhD candidates that basically uh, be strategic also in what kind of external examiner you select, if that it's possible uh, at your institution. Right, right, right. Yeah, with that, I would say that we continue chatting about the interviewing process. So first question for you, did you have um, any screening calls before your full uh, visits? Yeah, I think in most of the schools, um, I have a screening call, um, except for one school. Um, yeah, so I think this um, um, phone call the first round of phone call interview is quite common now. It's a common strategy that uh, the department use to check with um, the candidate. And how do this typically work? Is it that um, you only get questions or can you also ask a question? Is it more like a conversation? Um, yeah. Yeah, it really depends on the school. I think most of the schools, they have uh, a list of standard questions they can ask, like uh, tell me about your research. Um, uh, what's your future work and what's the significance of your work and blah, blah, blah. Those are standard questions. And then at the end, you get the option to ask two or three questions. Some schools, um, they will go freestyle that every faculty interviewed um, who are there in, in the um, um, phone interview will ask their own questions. Did you know in advance with whom you would be talking in this uh, phone interviews? Yes, yes. Oftentimes they will tell, like they will, um, the um, the coordinator will just send out an email and CC all the person who will be at the phone interview to let the candidate know who will be this in the uh, interview. I see. And for this kind of full visits, um, how long before the actual visit did you typically get this uh, schedule, which says basically with whom you will be talking to um, and so on? So that, um, they often send out the list of uh, the schedule, um, like between a week before or a day before, it really depends. So 
it doesn't hurt. Sometimes, you know, uh, this here is kind of like, uh, it's a little bit um, different from previous years um, because it's a pandemic and everything is virtual. Um, and a lot of schools are doing this for the first time. So I, for some schools, um, it, it, it was now the schedule pretty late, uh, which makes sense, you know, because of the, you know, pandemic. Um, so I think it doesn't hurt to just uh, email the coordinator and ask, you know, um, can I have my schedule, right? Can, can you give me a rough schedule or some uh, ballpark member of candidates, I, uh, faculty uh, members I, I need to talk to, right? Um, and I think that's, that's totally reasonable to do. I will actually, I will stress not, I will stress people to ask early, like if they do not receive the schedule, like two days before the um, their um, visit. Uh, because if you just receive the, that a day earlier, then it's hard to prepare for that, right? Uh, look at the um, that page of the other people you will talk to in the visit. Right? Mm -hmm. It will not be enough time. And I guess it's also often that um, the person you would be communicating to is typically the host, right? And the host is, is on your side. So uh, probably the one who advocates uh, for, for you or so uh, I guess this makes the request even more reasonable to, to ask or. Oh, yeah, uh, the host, right? You are talking about the host of uh, your radio. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes people just um, really have a person like who is working on similar topics or in a similar area to be a host. And it's oftentimes like, yeah, I think the, you, the candidate can feel free to ask anything to the, to the host, right? Um, and as long as it's reasonable, right? Um, and, uh, and it's their right to say no or like, to, right. but I think most times uh, ho the host will try their best to, to help with the candidate. So don't, don't be afraid of reaching out. Sometimes you also get asked whether you want to, um, like whether you want to point out any specific faculty members that uh, should be part of your uh, visit. So um, did you ever respond to such a uh, request and pointed out some names uh, that you would like to be part of, of this uh, visit or, or not? Yeah, if I really want to talk to some person, I will just point it out. I think I did, I did that most of the time um, because I first, I want to make sure that um, they do not arrange some meetings with someone who are just happen to be available or someone that I want to, um, I want to um, meet, right? Because we shouldn't really think about this as just a job search. It's also a good networking opportunity, right? Talking, going to different departments and talking to the people who work on exciting research, not necessarily in your own field, uh, but in some uh, field that you feel excited about. So oftentimes I will pick some names um, that I want to meet and maybe there is a future collaboration opportunity or someone working on exciting research that I want to know more about to be on my, um, as my interview interviewer. Okay. Yeah, what did you visit at uh, Purdue look like? What was the structure? It's it's a it's a very uh, it's a very good uh, visit. So it's uh, I think Purdue actually they actually send me a bucket of uh, snacks, you know, <laughs> real snacks, you know, like a day before my visit. So they have this um, they plan it very well. Like I've got this uh, bucket of snacks. Um, a day before my uh, job interview. And my job interview is, looks like it's a one and a half day. Um, and uh, I give my job talking the first morning. And uh, I, do I meet someone? I did a quick check-in with my host. And then I forgot if I meet someone between my uh, talking to my host or uh, the job interview. But then the afternoon is just uh, talking to a lot of faculty members. And the second the morning is also talking to a lot of faculty members. And in the middle, I'm talking to, I talked to the uh, associate dean um, of the College of Science, so where associate dean basically tell me about the, um, their support for junior faculty, um, the tenure, tenure expectation, et cetera. 
so some logistics uh, stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, then it's mostly just the talking to the CS back dealer. And did you also talk to students uh, during this meeting? Oh, yes. I talked to the students in the first afternoon. Um, and uh, yeah, I talked to a couple of students there. And it's uh, similar to many other universities um, that, um, yeah, um, I asked some questions to the students. Students asked questions to me. Mm -hmm. So if you had to describe some uh, let's call it uh, stereotypical kinds of reviewers. Um, like how how would you come up with uh, certain categories? For example, okay. someone someone who always uh, begins the meeting asking, "Do you have any questions?" or other kinds of of these reviewers. It's all kinds of. Uh, it really depends on the style of that person and how excited that person is about your research, right? Um, so there are. There are sometimes there are people who are um, who are more willing to talk, who know the research, who went to the job talk, and then um, ask me about your questions. And in that case, I'm mostly just listening and uh, answering questions. And there are folks who are um, who seem less excited about my research and just being there, trying to help me to understand the department and the university, share their experience. And in that case, I'm mostly asking questions um, that I, I want to know, right? Um, yeah, it's mostly this two type. Or there are folks who are super research driven. They ask questions about, um, uh, about your research. And there are folks who are more, less research driven, that they are willing to talk more about the teaching, you know, diversity, life in town and uh, uh, yeah, all that. So, there are different styles for sure. So during these interviews, what kind of uh, questions did you typically receive? And can you remember any questions um, that were surprising or notable in, in some other way? I didn't receive any questions that are surprising. So I think um, a typical question that people will start with is, uh, tell me about your research or something like, oh, I, I, I had a meeting, I have to teach, and I didn't go to your job talk. Can you tell me about what's your job talk about? Right. And then from there, you're going to ask more detailed questions uh, about your research. It's kind of like a starting point, and you have this conversation going on about more about research. Um, I don't feel that I, for most of the interviews, I feel I was not interviewed. Because it's not like an like a industry, interview industry, that people have a set of prepared, uh, predefined questions, and they're going to ask you about that, right? It's, it's more like a conversation that we are chatting about research and also checking about life, um, you know, um, et cetera. And a lot of times, yeah, it's, it's about like getting to know each other's research, right? Before I go to each interview, I often look at people's research um, um, and then I also ask about their research. I'm thinking about whether there is, it's, it's also kind of like a, about thinking ahead of time. Like if we made me offer, and if I'm going to work with this person for um, for the next, be a colleague for the next five or 10 years, what kind of project can I work together with that person? Did you receive any kind of questions that um, interviewers actually are not supposed to ask? For example, um, about your, uh, like whether you have a partner or not, or for what other kind of schools you're applying for? No, not really. I see, okay. Yeah, I often just tell, like I, I I'm actually, because I do have a body problem um, that I often, I just uh, bring this up during the meeting with the department head. Mm -hmm. um, but other faculty candidates, they often, uh, not, not faculty candidates, other faculty members I have met, they often do not ask me this kind of questions, unless I bring this up. I see, okay. Yeah, I actually received it for, for some of the visits. People may ask, you, you know, um, one thing people may ask is, um, they may ask like whether you have a partner, like to body issue, um, because the, some schools are trying to help um, and they want to advocate uh, about their, like their effort on solving body issues. It's not all the schools are willing to solve or are, are willing to sp spend effort on this. Um, but I think especially U.S. schools, many U.S. schools, they are really good at solving body issues. 
and they want to advocate for that. So I think it's a good gesture. Don't take it personal. They are not trying to like, if you have a body issue, they want to make an offer. Right? I, I think it's the opposite um, based on my feeling that people, sometimes I can feel that some of the department had to feel very happy that I bring this up uh, because they have really good programs to help you solve the body issues. And they want to, I think they are not allowed to ask um, but they, once you bring this up, they can brag all about like how many faculty they have helped with, right? So. I think, yeah. That's for me also, I actively brought up my two body situation. So, so now we talked quite a bit about interviewing. Um, let's continue with hearing back and decision making. And that's the first question there. How long did it take uh, to hear back? And also, could you get any kind of uh, information, for example, through internal contacts or so? Um, before you got the official offer? I think it also depends. Um, some schools, I got uh, the offer very soon, like within a week after my interview. For some schools, it just takes longer. Um, it also, first it depends on the, um, on the schedule of the, university, uh, of the school, like when they're gonna have their first um, faculty meeting to discuss those candidates. And some schools will just, uh, they are not allowed to make a decision until they finish all the uh, interviews. Some schools, they are allowed to make an early decision, like, uh, like once they um, interview one person, they can have a faculty meeting and discuss, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, that's one factor. And also it depends on um, like the rank of the candidate, you know, after the job talk, the job interview, people will, will uh, kind of like rank their candidates. They will make offers based on the rank, right? They make the offer to the first uh, who rank the highest. And then that person may take uh, like a couple months, not a couple months, but a couple of weeks to decide. And uh, if that person turn it down, then they're going to move on to the second the highest candidate. Um, it also really depends on the school, you know, like um, some schools we can be allowed to make multiple offers. Um, and some schools we are allowed to make only make one offer if there is only one position, right? Uh, they're only allowed to make one offer at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really, that really depends, that is kind of like it depends on the financial situation of the university. Like it's, it's a rule made by the college or like the university not the department so it, it really varies a lot i see and when you uh, when you then got the offer was it directly the written contract or was it more like an email first uh, saying that you would actually get an offer or was it even a phone call in in some of the cases yeah i think that most of the uh, um, offers i have got is kind of like an email um from the department head that um they want to talk, right? Um, and then we have a phone call and talk about, you know, um, get some ballpark numbers, um, parameters about the job offer. And then the department head will ask you like uh, what you, like whether there's uh, anything you want to um, like uh, change in those parameters. And then the candidate will tell the, um, the department head and the department had me talk to the dean and to discuss like whether it's a reasonable change or not. And then once they converge, I think the written offer is generated. Um, and then the, the candidate will get a certain amount of time to decide whether they want to uh, accept it or not. That's roughly the process. I don't, I don't receive first, I don't receive many offers. So uh, I don't have many data points. Um, so the schools who have made me offer, they do not actually um, write anything in the first email. So it's often this email saying that, okay, can we have a time to talk about uh, something? Uh, sometimes those emails do not actually say that it's an uh, it's offer. Um, but oftentimes, if you receive such an email, it's oftentimes it's an offer. Okay. And you mentioned that um, typically these offers uh, come with an expiration date attached. So did you ever ask for a deadline extension? And if yes, how did you uh, phrase such a request? Yeah, I do ask for a deadline extension um, because I 
uh, it's uh, the deadline is um, before I finish my last thing here. So I asked for uh, an extension of the deadline um, to actually like, uh, let me, it's kind of like, uh, let me finish all my interview first, right? Uh, and I also, I have, but because I have this body problem, um, I actually have to talk with my, uh, my partner and also my, uh, my parents to, to decide on like, what is, uh, whether it's a good choice for me or not. So that also takes a lot of time um, um, because my, my partner um, um, has uh, certain preferences mm -hmm. uh, that I was trying very hard to convince her, uh, but then does not uh, successfully do that uh, eventually. So uh, yeah, that, that just uh, takes a lot, lot of time. Yeah, I think, but many other candidates, uh, like if they do not have to body issue, I think it's, it will be a much easier. Uh, like if just, they can make a decision based on their own preferences. Yeah, 100% yeah. agree with that. <laughs> and um, did the university actually also um, like actively help you with resolving the uh, two body situation? You already briefly touched upon this uh, before. Or could yeah. actually the university be helpful with this? I think it really, really depends, you know, um, some universities, if they have the tradition um, of solving two body problems, they did well. So some universities, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like if the CS department does not have a lot of power compared with other departments, or if there is a financial situation, which is often the case for this year, right? Um, they probably have limited uh, power to help the candidate to solve the body issue. Right. Um, and I think, yeah, but I think it's always good to bring this up uh, because sometimes uh, some departments are really good at solving this problem. And sometimes you have to try really hard to push the department to solve the problem. Uh, yeah. I see. And um, after receiving the offer and um, like between receiving the offer and deciding, did you also again meet with some of the faculty members to discuss a bit more? Uh, yes, I do. I do because it's a big decision. You know, it's um, it's a big decision that I, I need to make sure that um, I know more about the department. And also, you know, this year is uh, is a very special. It's all virtual visit, so you do not actually get the opportunity to go to the city, to see the city, to see the university, to see the department. Right? You do not talk to people in person. So it's really hard to assess whether you want to live there and work with the folks there uh, for the next five or 10 years, just based on some um, phone call, like a video call, right? So mm -hmm. I indeed schedule um, some meetings um, with other folks to decide that if I'm a good fit for the department, if um, um, I feel comfortable with the department culture, if I feel comfortable living in the city, uh, et cetera. So I think that's, uh, that's something that I often do. Basically, I just email some other people. Um, sometimes it's a code email and asking that, okay, I'm a, I got the offer from the department and I'm a, consider it very seriously. And then can we have a talk, like a short meeting? Makes sense. So I think it's uh, time to wrap up. And as a first question there, uh, like what was the role of uh, peers in the whole process? Did you, for example, uh, exchange information with your peers? Did you coordinate with, with them and so on? Yes, um, I, do, I, I do exchange information. And uh, even before that, during the uh, job material preparation phase, I, um, well, after I write my first draft of my research statement, I actually uh, shared my research statement with a few folks uh, who are on the, also on the job market this year. And they also shared your, uh, theirs that we actually um, added and give comments, feedback to each other about the research statement. I, I think that's really helpful. Um, not just the folks who are on the job market, but also other folks uh, who are um, who I trust that I also send my uh, research statement draft to them and, uh, and have them take a look and give some feedback. During the process, I, I indeed just uh, change the information, exchange the information with uh, some other folks um, who are on the job market. And I find it is super helpful because otherwise it's, it's just me alone, you know, staying in my apartment, um, not being able to talk to anyone. 
it's going to be so much pressure, right? Uh, sometimes you have to vent. Yes, <laughs> and, exactly. You know, what's really going on with other folks? Um, and uh, uh, so I think that constantly talking to others is really helpful. And what kind of memories um, did stuck with you? Do you have any kind of uh, anecdotes to tell or any kind of surprising or special moments during the whole uh, process? Yeah, I think the most, I see, most memorable experience I had is, is my first, my phone interview with Kamel. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I got, you interviewed there, so you probably yeah. he asked you that question too. So um, there is a faculty uh, asking me this question about like, what is the research problem? in your field that is Turing award winning, right? Uh, can win a Turing award. Or like, a, I think the way he asked the question is more like, okay, what is the research problem that a Turing award winner should solve or are willing to solve in your research field? But not just you, but a Turing, seriously, a Turing award winner. But I think oh. that's, that's a very interesting question. I never thought about it. You know, a lot of times when I decided which topic I want to work on, I'm um, thinking about whether it's an interesting problem, but it, from my own perspective, but I've never thought about whether what a Turing Award winner may think about this, right? Uh, what, or whether the problem will receive a Turing Award or not, right? Um, so that is a question that makes me think quite a bit in the next couple of weeks, like what would be such a problem? All right. Luckily, yeah. I didn't receive the question, so. Oh, you didn't receive uh, the question? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I see. I see. But I received a similar one actually, which was um, like, what is the most um, impactful? I, I forgot exactly how it was phrased, but um, the question was similar in the sense that it asked me for um, like a noteworthy paper that I recently read, and uh, this was oh, actually okay. one of the questions where I stumbled a bit and had to quickly. Uh, come up with uh, some reasonable answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, you know, it's a, uh, the reason I remember it so much because I, I think a lot, you know, after receiving that question offline. Um, and also, oftentimes I think about, when I should think about research, I'm thinking about, okay, what I'm going to do in the next uh, two years, what I'm going to do in the next five years, 10 years, and 12, 20 years, right? 20 years is the maximum. Like, I, I try not to think too much after 20 years. Um, but then uh, this question really made, made me to think about like uh, what is, because when we are talking about Turing Award, it's probably next, uh, like some research will sustain after 30 years, more than 20 years at least. Yeah, so it got me start thinking about that. Right. Like if I was like a 60 or 70, like what, 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 what would be the research problem um, that people value a lot? if we retrospectively at that stage. Right. And um, perhaps as a last question, or actually two questions at once. So what would you have done differently in retrospective and uh, very related to this, what kind of advice uh, would you have for future faculty candidates? I will see think abroad and think deep, right? Um, I think a lot of times, uh, a lot of candidates, who are on the job market, they already proven that they are good at research, you know, executing research uh, uh, plans, uh, writing papers. And, uh, but I think it's uh, a lot of times uh, people need to spend more time to thinking about uh, something bigger, right, broader. Uh, what's the value of the research? What's your research vision? What does uh, um, What's the impact? Really, the impact of the research does it help to help with uh, other folks, right? Um, does it makes advance the society or advance the science, right? Um, or is it just an, another paper, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the mindset people all should have when they if they haven't thought about this. Um, I think are thinking a lot about this during my postdoc. Um, during my PhD, it's always kind of like, okay, what's the next exciting research idea um, I should work on? But I haven't really think from a thousand miles you know, about the research. 
um, I will I I encourage people to start thinking about early um, and assess the value of their research um, because you you can see that <clears throat> just to, especially after going on the job market you know I can tell that a lot of uh, good universities they really do not care how many papers you publish right they care about the impact, the value of the research, like does it help? Um, um, for example, you, you are a good example, right, Manu? Um, is you actually do something that find many real bugs. That's re really good impact. It's not just a single paper. It's actually um, it's actually something that um, that is useful to a lot of people in industry, not just academia. So that I will call that as a very good uh, and big impact. And I know another friend of mine, um, Yu Huang from Umich, Um, she has worked on something like at the in this intersection of uh, neuroscience plus software engineering. That's really new, right? That's something she's, I think she's the first one who kind of like started this line of research. That's kind of like a new research direction. That's a value because uh, her research is so inspiring that a lot of people are following the research. Uh, so I think that's something people should think about, um, like to assess, uh, like it, it's probably also the way other, like the department is assessing the candidates. So um, seriously, it's not just about the paper numbers, it's about the value and impact of research. That's uh, excellent advice. And also thank you for the kind words as well. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks a lot for uh, training us uh, today, Jay, and all the best with your uh, new career as a assistant professor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>